Hello, my name is Josh Scroggins, and I will be presenting carbon nanotube field effect transistors. This presentation is going to range from looking at the structure of graphene itself, which gets rolled up into a carbon nanotube, to certain selected device fabrication techniques, to the current and voltage characteristics of these devices. And finally, we're going to end by comparing these devices to what we have been using for many decades now, the MOSFET. Carbon nanotubes can be used to replace the channel material in a bulk MOSFET in order to tackle the problem of scaling and shrinking down transistors to the sub-22 nanometer range. So to remind you, what are the current problems with trying to shrink our MOSFETs beyond a certain limit? Well, leakage current and thus passive power dissipation is a huge problem. We would like to have as close to zero leakage current possible while maintaining a high on-current intraout or saturation. This is a particularly hard trade-off to come to terms with. Other problems include short channel effects like velocity saturation, electron tunneling currents where electrons can tunnel through certain barriers, and variations in device doping and structure. Like I said earlier, a carbon nanotube is simply a rolled up sheet of graphene, which is a two-dimensional hexagonal crystal lattice of carbon atoms. The fact that this carbon nanotube is hollow and has a lack of boundaries is quite advantageous. Using a single particle type binding model, we can model the energy bands of graphene. It turns out that the band gap energy here depends on the bond distance between carbon atoms, A, and the nanotube diameter, DT. It also mathematically depends on gamma, the hopping matrix element, which I won't talk about here. The figure here is showing both the chiral vector and the translation vector for a graphene lattice. The result here is stated, which shows the diameter of the nanotube, DT, and the chiral angle, which are based on which vector we choose based on M and N. The differences in the chiral angle and nanotube diameter are important because they determine the differences in electrical properties. And since the periodic boundary conditions only permit a few wave vectors to exist around the circumference of the carbon nanotube, we will have certain conditions that determine the material's band gap and state. Metallic conduction occurs when one of these wave vectors passes through the k-point of the Brillouin zone, where the conduction and valence bands are degenerate. And for the semiconducting nanotubes, the band gap depends on the nanotube's diameter, which we saw earlier. So for metallic conduction, n must be equal to m. Then our other two cases are when n minus m, either are exact integer multiples of 3, or are not, making the carbon nanotube semi-metallic or semiconducting, respectively. Moving on to device fabrication, the earliest fab technique used multiple parallel metal strips across a silicon dioxide substrate. Carbon nanotubes would be deposited randomly across the entire surface, which you can see on the top figure. If a nanotube successfully lied across two different metal strips, then these two strips now act as the source and drain. By adding a metal contact on the other side of the substrate, a gate is created. There are some main drawbacks, however. There's very little contact between the metal contacts and the carbon nanotube. There's a metal to semiconductor Schottky barrier, which increases contact resistance, and the back gate geometry thickness makes it difficult for switching with low voltages. Although I should say that the Schottky barrier problem can be mitigated by choosing a metal with a work function that matches the substrate as closely as possible. Typically, palladium is chosen as the metal. So that was the back gated CNT FET. Years go by and they greatly improved with the new fab technique that creates a top gated CNT FET. The first step is to solution deposit carbon nanotubes into a silicon dioxide substrate. These nanotubes can be located with a scanning electron microscope and using high resolution electron beam lithography, the source and drain contacts are made. Then a high temperature anneal step is applied to reduce contact resistance. A thin top gate dielectric is deposited on top of the carbon nanotube via atomic layer deposition and the top gate contact is deposited on top of that gate dielectric. Although this is a more complicated fabrication process, it allows for a larger electric field with a lower gate voltage with respect to the nanotube, and arrays of the top gated CNT FETs can be made on one wafer. In 2008, they were able to come up with the idea of gating the entire carbon nanotube by first wrapping a gate dielectric around the entire nanotube, and then wrapping a metal contact layer on top of that using atomic layer deposition. They etch off the end so that it looks like the top figure, and then solution deposit the nanotube on a silicon dioxide substrate. After that, they complete the process by depositing the source, drain, and gate contacts, so that we now have a product that looks like the bottom figure. The gate all around CNT FET is better than the top gated version because there's less leakage current and also a higher on current. 
Another fabrication technique aims to reduce contact between the carbon nanotube and the substrate and gate oxide, which does reduce scattering at the nanotube substrate interface. And there's multiple ways to do this, like transferring nanotubes onto the substrate and under etching dielectric beneath, or perhaps using catalyst particles to grow the carbon nanotubes off the trenches that are already there. There are a couple of problems with this fab technique that keep it from being used more than the gate all around device. The suspended nanotube can droop towards the gate since the gate bias will attract it. This creates an upper limit on how much gate bias you can apply. Secondly, the gate dielectric is limited in material options. Usually, aerovacuum must be used. Moving on to the IV characteristics. A CNT FET will maintain the typical IDS versus VDS and VGS curves uh, that we know. Right now, I'm only talking about the shape of the curves and the modes of operation, such as cutoff, trap, saturation, not the exact values. Other current characteristics of the CNT FET are planar CNT FETs produce a higher saturation current with a shorter channel length, and they also have a higher saturation current when the nanotube has a smaller diameter holding length constant. A cylindrical CNT FET drives a higher drain current than a planar one. One of the most important aspects of the CNT FET is its carrier transport mechanisms. While there is a shocky barrier between the source and drain contacts and the nanotube, which allows only one type of carrier to pass, depending on that type of barrier, quantum mechanical tunneling is the dominant transport in a CNT FET, making it possible for either electrons or holes, or both at the same time, to be injected simultaneously. Thus, the shocky barrier thickness is an important factor. Starting here is an overview of a mathematical derivation to find the drain current. It starts by defining the carrier densities in the source and drain, as well as the equilibrium electron density. It also defines the self-consistent voltage, VSC, which implicitly relates terminal voltages and charges, and some of the parameters are defined on the next slide. QT is the st charge stored in the terminal capacitances, and C tote is the sum of the gate, drain, and source capacitances. By using the newton rapson iterative numerical method, we can find the result for the drain current as this, where we need to evaluate the Fermi Dirac order zero integral at two specific energy states. Notice how, if VSC is not known, the calculation becomes quite dense and lengthy. So, let's go over some advantages of a CNT FET over a MOSFET. Some of this I've already talked about, but other key aspects that provide advantages are things like the carbon nanotube can only have forward and back scattering. This along with elastic scattering means carriers have a long mean free path, allowing transport along relatively long lengths and low electric fields. Carbon nanotubes are chemically inert due to sp2 carbon-carbon bonding, allowing for large amounts of current, and CNT FETs can switch using much less power than silicon-based devices due to their ability to conduct large amounts of heat and their nanoscale size. A P-type MOSFET can produce around 500 amps per meter and an overdrive voltage of 0.6 volts, while a similar P-type CNT FET can produce around 1500 amps per meter at the same gate overdrive. The higher effective gate capacitance per unit width and higher carrier velocities allow for this, along with approximately four times higher transconductance than a MOSFET. However, the main problem with carbon nanotube FETs is their reliability and lifetimes. A carbon nanotube can degrade in a few days when exposed to oxygen and can also have trouble when operating under high fields and temperature gradients. When applying high enough voltages beyond the avalanche breakdown point for semiconducting nanotubes, the channel will basically be destroyed. The main solution to this so far is to use multi-channeled CNT FETs, which can perform for several months. This is basically a fail-safe method, letting the transistor to keep functioning on a new channel once an old one has broken down. And of course, another non-negligible problem facing CNT FETs is the lack of mass production available to them. In conclusion, the electronic structure of graphene allows its properties to be controlled. And while there are many ways to fabricate carbon nanotube FETs, we discussed four notable ones. Back gate, top gate, gate all around, and the suspended CNT FET. Carbon nanotube FETs can offer some very real performance advantages over MOSFETs, but due to breakdown on unreliability and mass production impracticality so far, these relatively new devices are nowhere near overtaking MOSFETs.